Boa tarde a todo mundo. É, estamos aqui hoje para esse debate. Acho que a maioria já conhece os dois debatedores. O Vladimir ele é professor de filosofia na USP e é, posso dizer que é o, acho que é o filósofo hoje em dia mais respeitado por todo, até os partidos políticos ou todo mundo de pensamento de esquerda reconhece o, o Vladimir como assim um, um norte do pensamento da esquerda mesmo. E o Stefan Molinan veio do Canadá para um evento que teve segunda-feira e a gente organizou esse debate. Ele tem umas ideias que a gente pode dizer em muitos pontos opostas ao Vladimir, principalmente quanto à função do Estado, que é o tema do debate. Então, vamos deixar eles conversarem aí e ver se eles conseguem resolver alguma coisa aí. Três. Eles, ah, o debate vai ser... Eles vão em inglês. E não vai ter limite de tempo, de número de réplicas, de tréplicas, com alguns debates. Eles vão mais focar nas ideias e vão abordar alguns temas mais focado na, no Estado e tentar chegar em alguma desavença ou, ou reconhecer alguma, algum ponto em comum que eles tenham. Obrigado. Hello, hello. I, I didn't follow any of that. He could just be saying, he's the bald foreigner who will be proven wrong. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I, I do apologize for doing this in English, uh, in a Portuguese-speaking country. I apologize. Um, it is not being a good guest, but I've spent more time learning philosophy than learning Portuguese. So, uh, I appreciate your hospitality, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, next time. Uh, I will not have learned Portuguese, but I will do it in mime. So this will be better. Uh, are we, uh, did you want to, uh, to be introduce our, our colleague and friend here yet? Yeah, we're ready. We're ready? So are we ready to start? Yes, Should I start? Okay. Well, the question that we are going to talk about tonight, which is, I think, a very essential question, the most essential question, uh, is uh, we have talked, we're going to be talking about the function of the state in society. And I think uh, that it is always, always essential to start with, um, with definitions, uh, to, to know what we are talking about so that we are using the same words to mean the same things, otherwise we end up uh, in terrible realms of confusion. So uh, I'm going to start. Uh, I assume that, unlike Bill Clinton, you know what the means <laughs> and of and there's another the. But the other three words, social, function, and state, uh, need to be clarified, for me at least. And if we have disagreements about the definitions, we should resolve those before we continue. Otherwise, confusion doesn't get solved. But to me, 90% of achieving the truth is all in the definitions. So we'll start with that. So uh, the social function of the state, the word social, so important to understand what we're talking about. And for me, Social means things which are voluntary, things which are not coerced, things which are not the response of violence. So when you say, and if this makes no sense uh, in, in what you say, just tell me and I'll try and rephrase it. But when I say, I'm having a social engagement, this does not mean I'm going to rob a bank. Does that, does that make sense? If, I, if I'm having a social tea, Uh, this doesn't mean that I'm rounding people up with police dogs and bringing them to my house. So social to me means uh, a voluntary, like I assume everyone here is here by choice uh, and, uh, and uh, obviously there's some bribery. My daughter got candy. She's here for candy, but most of you I hope are here, <laughs> not because of bribery and threats, but by choice. And so uh, I would like to define the social as, as that which is, which is voluntary. So for instance, uh, We don't think that it is a social life if we are in prison. You know, we have in interactions with other people, mostly running and you know, <laughs> hiding and doing whatever we can. But this is not social. Social is that which is chosen. So the social, when I'm talking about the social function of the state, I mean that which is chosen. Function, uh, say a little thing on your keyboard. That, uh, but function is um, uh, something around improving or facilitating um, to enhance 
Uh, so when we say you know, that, that there is a reproductive function to sex, to having sex, and so it is something which uh, facilitates and extends or expands, it's something to do with it either works or it's improving or something like that. So when we talk about the social function of the state, it has to be something that improves or, or, or makes better or at least facilitates something being possible. Uh, is, am I going too fast, too slow? Is this okay? Yeah, is all right? Okay. If people start to, then I'll slow down. But uh, if I go too slow, I start to feel like I'm getting sleepy. So that's your job, to feel sleepy. Um, now, the state. Ah, uh, the state. That is a challenging thing to define. Uh, it, this, the word means so many things, I'm sure, in Portuguese as well, but um, I'm going to make a very rigid, rigorous philosophical definition. Now, the state is not a thing. We, we, we always use this language, like the state is a person, or the state is a thing. But like I was just reading um, about uh, in, in, in Canada, the state funds, gives money to... Uh, builds, the state makes the roads, the state educates the children like it's, uh, in America they call it Uncle Sam. Do you have a similar phrase here? No? My criminal cousin? Uh, no? Okay. Uh, so Uncle Sam they call it in the States. I'm sorry? The not so silent partner, right, right. I think that's my wife's uh, phrase as well. Um, but the state is not a thing. I had a debate some time back with some people in uh, in America, and I said this. And I make this argument that the, the state does not exist. It is not a thing. It is not a person. It is not a rock. It is not a tree. And uh, I got sent a lot of emails, and there were pictures of the White House, and, and pictures of the Pentagon, and and pictures of the Federal Reserve, and and pictures of all of the the, the pictures of men like an army marching, and they say this is the state, and I said, but that's not the state. This is a white building. This is a, I guess, a sort of hexagon building. Uh, this is um, another building uh, with big columns. It's got the word Federal Reserve. And uh, this is some men in a green costume. But this is not the state. These are just things and buildings and people and guns. Ah, always with the guns, right? But the state is not a thing. The state is, so what is it? Well, the state, I will argue, or at least make the case, it is a claim that some people make that their use of force is legitimate, is good, is necessary, is moral, is essential for society. You know, we say, oh, we're without a state, and, uh, terrible, horrible things, and nobody can trade, nobody can raise their children, and motorcycle gangs, well... It seems you already have them here, just driving all the way down between the cars. That, that's crazy. We actually saw on the way down, uh, one of them got uh, a little bumped. But so, the state is a state of mind. It is, it is our acceptance of the principle that a small group of people can use guns to get what they want, to make law. Law is an opinion with lots of guns. Uh, you write it down and suddenly it's like a magic spell. It becomes virtuous. Uh, and um, so the, the state is our acceptance that it is good for some people to use force. And philosophically, it's, this is a crazy notion. Uh, it's crazy. But people say, well, the state is, is legitimized, is valid, is true and good because the majority accepts it. The majority, 50% plus one makes something from bad to good. Uh, this is not... We, we accept this nowhere else in society, right? So if, uh, if, if three guys are walking down an alley and two of them decide to take one guy's wallet and they vote, we, it doesn't make it right, even if there's, it's a two-thirds majority saying, I will get your wallet. This doesn't make any sense at all. So that, that is not something that is valid, but it is what is the state, is what is defined as the state. And... I'm going to skip, but maybe we'll come back into this. There are lots of reasons why the majority argument doesn't work, but uh, it, it is this acceptance that we have a minority of people who can use all the force in the world. So when we put all of this together, we've got the social function of the state. Social is defined as that which is voluntary. 
that which is romantic versus that which is rape, right? The same, it may end in the same physical act, but one is voluntary and one is evil, is, is immoral, is involuntary. And so if social is that which is voluntary and function is that which improves or facilitates the voluntary, then saying the social function of the state is exactly like saying the romantic function of rape. It is an opposite. That which we allow to be coerced is the opposite, logically, morally, commonsensically. That which we allow to be coercive and violent and predatory is the opposite of that which is voluntary. So that not only is there no social function for the state, but whatever functions for the state is the opposite of society. It's the opposite of what is chosen. If you are coerced, that is the opposite of what is chosen. And the last thing that I'll say before allowing you to <laughs> take down all of these arguments that have been put, put up is that, uh, you know, we hear, strangely enough, from all the government teachers, we hear that the government reflects the will of the people. Anyone ever hear this? social contract, will of the people, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, this is not something we have to think about very hard. It's just surprising. It's, it's a surprising thought because we hear so much to the opposite. That which is coerced is obviously the opposite of what somebody wants. So if I'm walking down the street and a man comes up to me and says, uh, give me 10 reals. See, a little Portuguese flavor there. Give me 10 reals. And I say, yeah, okay, here, I've had a, I won the lottery, I've had a good day, my horse came in, here you go. Well, that is a choice. He has asked me for money and he has given me. So we know, praxeologically, we know just logically, empirically, that I wanted to give him the money. We don't know if I would have given him the money if he hadn't asked, but that doesn't matter. The reality is he asked me for the, the 10 rails and I gave him the money, it's choice. Ah, but if there is a gun to my ribs, we know that I do not want to give him the money. Or, at the very least, we know that he does not think <laughs> that I want to give him the money. If you could get 10 reals just by asking without putting a gun to someone's ribs, you would do that because you're not exposing yourself to retaliation, to my ninja moves, or to a possible criminal sentence or anything like that. And so when a gun is in someone's ribs, we know for sure that this is what, what happens is not what they want because otherwise there would be no need for the gun. The state initiates force against citizens uh, all the time. Uh, all the time. And this is, its essence is it is the only uh, agency that has that right. If you live, uh, w w what is the mafia called in, I mean not the government, but the other one. What is the mafia called in, in, in Brazil? I'm sorry? PCC. PCC? Okay. So if you uh, are running a, a restaurant in the PCC neighborhood and some shady guy comes and says, listen, uh, we're going to need to send you a bill for protection because we don't want something bad <laughs> to happen to your store and you give them the money, you, uh, you give it to them because they're threatening you, but you don't consider this to be moral, necessary, legitimate. It's just something you suffer through, you know. Uh, and so, um, but, but we know you don't want to give the money voluntarily because there is the threat, of course, and the government uses threats uh, all the time and interferes with the free flow of, of ideas, of, of goods, of capital, of choice, of relationships, uh, business relationships, even personal relationships, and uh, this is wrong. So society is that which is voluntary, the state is that which is force, and force is the opposite of civil society. And that's uh, my introductory statement, and I'm happy to hear all the corrections in the world. Well, first I would like to apologize. Um, I'm really sick, and uh, my speaking will be, let's say, in a slow motion. And I will try to go until the end, but I'm not totally sure. Uh, second, I would like to, to thank this invitation. I think this is a very interesting <clears throat> uh, situation and moment. Uh, I don't think that it I will change your point of views concerning things very complex like states, individuals, and so on. Eh? But I'm sure that if you listen to me, 
maybe you can have a more rich and complex idea about what is a leftist stuff concerning states. And uh, I would like to listen uh, <clears throat> a liberal point of view exactly because I believe that uh, I don't need the stereotypes uh, of what is a liberal tough or something like this. Uh, then, <clears throat> well, this is, this is the reason that I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, concerning all these discussions, uh, I would like to, to put two points, two major points. Uh, first, uh, I understand this quits uh, that you made concerning the relationship between state and coercion. Uh, state uh, ki as a kind of uh, coercive um, structure. Uh, and uh, I can agree with this. Uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> some, some actions of the states can be really described in this way. But I have problems to say that, uh, well, what is the state? States is a coercive structure that uh, that block the let's say the autonomy and the authenticity of civil society uh, because uh, we can make this uh, this critics for every uh, institution that I have in mind. For example, I can say yes, but the family too is a coercive structure. Uh, uh, the the religion too. Uh, um, even the individuals, uh, uh, there is something absolutely coercive and disciplinary in the, cons in the constitution of an individuality. Uh, then I don't think that the good point of view is just to stress this, this characteristic concerning the state. I would like to say that uh, we have in modern TOF uh, uh, a very strong uh, essay to think what is a fair state. Uh, or if it's possible to say, well, uh, a state could be fair. Uh, and I believe in it. And I think that I would like to, to talk a little bit about this, this tradition that try to show how this state is a social structure uh, important in, let's say, in the institutionalization of freedom. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't agree with the idea that we are free just where the state is not uh, <coughs> operate, does not operate. Huh? Uh, because, for example, I can I can give an example of what I think. In it's not it's not possible to to talk about freedom in a situation, social situation. Uh, where we find uh, strong inequality. Uh, I think, for example, inequality is not just a question of social justice. It's a question of freedom. Uh, uh, there is no freedom in poverty. Uh, uh, it's the, well, we can, s we, can s we can be a kind of stoic and say, well, like Epitaph, uh, I can, I, I'm free in my mind, even if I'm a slave. Uh, I think this is not a very good point of view, uh, because I think that this, uh, this, this linkage between uh, freedom and, in, and interiority is, is there is, there is a, a, a strong problems in this, in this view. But if you, we accept that inequality is not just a question of social justice, but is a question of uh, how the society must run to freedom be effective, uh, to be a reality. Then the question is, uh, which kind of institution can develop a very strong politic uh, of equality in society? Uh, I think that uh, we can see in the history of, in the West history, uh, the state was very important on it. Uh, in the state was very important in this, let's say, universalization of rights. Yeah. We know, for example, uh, uh, there is a process, a historical process, uh, when some <coughs> vulnerable uh, part of, of the society could, could have, like today, for example, some rights uh, 
concerning uh, economies, uh, uh, concerning social service and things like this. And I think the state is very important in this, in this point of view. Huh? Well, the point that I would like to put is, well, the two points. The first is, uh, maybe it's the question to make a difference between what is a state is today and what the state could be. Huh? What is a kind of fair state? And second point is, I think that uh, we cannot uh, make a, a strong distinction between freedom in one side and equality in other side. If you cannot make this distinction, the state is a very important actor in this in this game. Just, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, that is uh, not uh, a shocking statement from somebody on the left, and I really understand it. I will take a couple of swings at it and see if I can make any sense of it. I think that we want to be clear in our distinctions of coercion versus non-coercion. Uh, coercion is the presence of weapons, of threats, of consequences, getting your butt dragged off to jail, um, being under house arrest uh, with people who will uh, shoot you. Uh, all laws come down to the threat of murder. I mean, people stay in jail because if they try to escape, they are killed. I mean, if some guy comes into my house in Canada, I have the right, I'm sure it is here too, some guy come, k kicks in my door, uh, you have the right of self-defense. In other words, if the only way that you can prevent the aggression is to use force, then you use force. And to me, this is morally legitimate. It's unfortunate. You don't want to have it, but you have that right. Uh, but if they're dressed in a blue costume, you can't do that because they will, they will kill you. Uh, if you don't pay your taxes, then uh, you will get a letter, uh, probably quite a nice letter at the beginning, uh, and then the letters will get shorter and <laughs> less nice, and then you will have a court date, and if you do not show up to the court date, then men will come to your house, and if you attempt to, attempt to act in self-defense, they will shoot you. I mean, this is the reality uh, that we don't often like to look at in the way that the cows don't like to go too close to the electric fence, they stay away, it's like, hey, I'm just roaming around, I like it here, <laughs> you know, it's my, my comfortable spot. But the reality is that this is the kind of coercion that I'm talking about. If we start to mix in things like, uh, there were a couple of other examples, uh, individuality is coercion. No, individuality is not pointing guns at people. The family is coercion. No, there is coercion in the family, there are people who hit each other in the family and so on, the parents who spank children in the family, but the family is not defined as the initiation of force and control. And there's, it's not a murder-based institution in the way that the state is. Uh, so I think you can say there's manipulation in the family. Now, interestingly enough, and I just want to touch on this very briefly, because I had a good, great question that I didn't answer, I think, as well as it could have in the talk I gave the other day about uh, religion. And uh, religion is interesting because religion is... Uh, it's a strongly Catholic uh, country here, so of course you have uh, hell. Is this still something that is accepted for most people in... I think the, the Pope is sort of ambivalent about it, and I think in England they've said, ah, too much work. But um, <laughs> too hot. Uh, you know, we like it chilly. Um, but uh, hell, of course, uh, is a threat of eternal damnation and torture for children, so it's really hard to say that the transmission of religion is entirely voluntary, a threat of violence, and hell is the ultimate threat of violence because you don't even get the escape of death because you're already dead. Uh, so it's hard to argue that that is voluntary. Uh, that could be another discussion. I'm happy to talk about religion. <laughs> well, sometimes. Uh, it can be a little stressful sometimes, but it is an important topic. But in the state, we're simply looking at, is there a gun in the room or not? Is there a gun in the room or not? Uh, if you date someone and you ask him or her to marry you and they choose of their own volition, they may regret their choice later. Uh, but, you know, maybe the husband will lose his hair. I mean, there could be any number of things that will happen, uh, but uh, it's still a free choice. You can unchoose it, but that is a choice. There's no gun, right, uh, in the room. So I just really wanted, I'm really just talking about gun, no gun, gun, no gun, uh, that, and gun willing to be used. I think that's, that's an important distinction. I think it's a fascinating and complex point that uh, my friend has brought up here, to the degree to which is poverty freedom. I, I think it's pretty hard to say yes, that it is, it is freedom. Um, uh, 
And there's no doubt that there is a massive amount of poverty uh, in the world. There's, I mean, it's certainly in Canada, there's more of it, I think, uh, here in Brazil. There are countries like Japan and China that have made huge strides in reducing the amount of poverty in society. But I think we can all generally accept. Uh, I, I read these studies recently that said, you know, 97% of poor people, people like under the legal definition of poverty in the US have color TVs, uh, internet, um, microwaves, 60% uh, of them own their own home, 70% of them have a car, you know, 20% of them have two cars. I mean, it's what we call poverty now compared to, you know, 400 years ago is, is you know, I would rather be the poorest person in a Western country than the king of France in the 17th century. I mean, <laughs> it was just there's much better life, much better opportunities. I think that the more we can give people opportunity and the more we can widen their capacity for choice, the better off they're going to be. What I've seen historically, the argument I'll make is that where you see great inequality, you see the state. Um, in the post, I'm sorry that most of my knowledge is about, I, I started reading about Brazil uh, quite a bit before I came down, but everything was so interesting <laughs> that I just kept following link after link and wow, this is, I got nothing useful done other than really learned a lot about Brazil that I couldn't use in a debate. This is fascinating stuff. So I'm sorry if I give you some examples from non-Brazilian environments, but uh, I mean, the free market uh, is the huge engine that lifts people out of poverty, 50, 60,000 people a month in India and China are moving into the middle class. I know the middle class is growing quite a bit here. Uh, the free market, the lack of coercion. The free market is simply, there's no gun. Doesn't mean you don't have regrets. We've all bought stuff that we didn't like, but uh, it may be too late to return it, but it's still a choice. Choice doesn't mean perfection. Choice just means no, not one of these uh, in the room, and where you have tariffs and taxes and controls and even minimum wages. I mean, this is the introduction of coercion. Uh, in the post-war period in the United States, poverty was declining 1% a year until the welfare state came in. As we all know, since the introduction of the welfare state, uh, poverty has, uh, the, the, the gap between rich and poor uh, has widened, enormously widened. Does anyone know how much in America personal wealth has declined in the past four years? I just read this yesterday. It is a shocking number. Does anyone know? 40%. 40%. <coughs> Is this because we have an excess of free markets in the states? No. Government has continued to grow and continue to grow. As governments grow, inequality grows. Think of the Soviet Union, I mean, where they had the, the, the upper, the Politburo and the rich, they had all their Dachau's on the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, and, you know, the Ivan Denisovich's were laboring for less than we could imagine. They're laboring for fruit with bugs in it. I mean, it was horrible. So I agree that, that poverty is a huge problem. Uh, the call, my, my friend here said was talking about rights, that, that the government is really good at extending rights. No, no, no. Government is really good at restricting rights. And then when we take away the government restriction of rights, when we forbid them to use force in certain areas, suddenly they claim that they've expanded rights. I mean, who enforced slavery? The government enforced slavery. You couldn't have slavery if you had to go and catch your slaves yourself. I mean, they just run off. And what are you going to do? No, you have slavery because the government will go and catch them for you and bring them back. It is the government that enforces slavery. Who didn't enforce the rights of contracts for women? It was the government. The government didn't do that. And uh, you can sort of go on and on. I mean, in Canada, the government uh, says it's perfectly fine to hit your children if they're between two years and 12 years of age. You see, 12 years in one day. <gasps> it's wrong. One day short of two years, it's wrong. Oh, next day, it's right. I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? I mean, so it is the government that is failing to protect us. This is not something that the government solves. This is a problem the government creates, and the degree to which we restrict and control and minimize the power of the state is the degree to which we get equality in society. And so, I, yeah, I agree that poverty is a big problem. Then the biggest governments should have the least poverty and the greatest equality, but we see over and over again, as government power grows, inequality grows, the middle class gets hollowed out. You get this polarization. The rich use the power of the state to line their own pockets. They use the legal protections of the one of the greatest evils called corporatism, called corporations. Corporations are huge legal shields that the rich hide behind to escape the consequences of their actions. Remember that BP oil spill? How many BP executives lost their homes because they weren't taking care of their rigs? How many bankers went to jail 
for destroying trillions of dollars of the world's wealth? Zero. How many protesters went to jail in the United States for singing Van Morrison in a public park? 2,500. The power of the state enriches the rich, impoverishes the poor. We um, were just driving around, and we were talking about this yesterday when we went uh, walking around Sao Paulo. I know that the, uh, the average Brazilian wage is six, seven thousand dollars, maybe a little more uh, U.S. dollars per year. And so naturally, we thought, well, you know, if the labor costs are so low here, we should go and buy a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, we should be, you know, rich, evil, gringo capitalists come in and and buy a bunch of stuff, which would bid up wages, which would increase everybody's uh, income over the long run. We went to the mall. Uh, I looked at a nice pair of slingback pumps. No. Okay, right. But we looked at shoes, and they were more expensive than Canada. We, we looked at uh, the, the electronics. It's like, well, not too bad. The tax is what? <laughs> 100% on an iPad. And so we can't. And is that because the government is doing something to help the poor? No. The government is not helping the poor because the government is not letting us purchase stuff, thus driving up the wages of the poor. The only way to raise the wages of the poor, not pass laws and point guns at people who won't hire them for more, raise the demand for the poor, which means lowering, lowering barriers to trade. Lowering barriers to trade always drives up. This is a sustainable way to increase the wealth of society. Passing laws, pointing guns at you and giving the money to you, I mean, it just completely distorts everything. Completely distorts everything. Um, so my argument is when you take the gun out of the room, human, human society, human interactions, human relationships, human economics always improve. Not necessarily for everyone all the time, of course not, right? But in general, that is the very, very clear trend. As government powers go down, the, the, the human condition improves. As government power increases, the human condition uh, decreases. I mean, to do all of this stuff, uh, to do all of the social engineering, the welfare state and this and that, the government has to do two things which are unbelievably bad for people. Number one, it has to take control of the money supply, right? Because to, to, to give people things, if you don't control the money supply, if you have a gold standard or whatever it is that maintains the value of currency, because I know in South America the value of currency can be quite an exciting thing as it is now for the rest of the world. If you want to give people things for free, you've got to take control of the money supply because it doesn't work otherwise. right? So if I say, well, I want to give everyone $100 or 100 reals, what do I have to do? I've got to tax them about 200 reals because I've got to pay my people <laughs> who move all this money around. I got to pay the tax collectors. I got to pay the people who make sure nobody's cheating. I got to make sure nobody's dead and trying to collect. Or I got to, you know, uh, I got to have the bureaucrats who are going to process the checks. And so I have to tax you. And, and how many politicians would say this? Aha! I'm going to pay you 100 reals and tax you 200 reals. Vote for me. I mean, this would not be anybody. So in order to give people the 100 reals, you have to take control of the money supply so you can print the money. And the people say, hey, look, I have 100 reals. How fantastic. But it only buys 20 or 30 or 40 reals worth of stuff because it's all so much. And then, of course, to when they control the money supply, they have to control the interest rates. Because if you print all this money, the interest rates go up. And all the money that you've borrowed to, to bribe all these people, interest rate goes up. And then the taxes have to go way up. And then everybody realizes what a game. Right? The Europeans are figuring this out. Fiat currencies all last about 30 or 40 years. And the US went fiat in 1971. And, it was in the 70s and 80s, and you know, it's about 30, 40 years that it lasts, and the euro is, you know, it's all, when you study history, it's all around, around, same thing over and over again. Everybody's just surprised who haven't read about the past. So the increased government power and inflation is the worst thing for the poor, because the rich can do defensive things with their money, but when the poor are poor and the price of bread is going up, this is unbelievably catastrophic. So this idea that you can appoint some group the last thing I'll say is if, if we are interested in equality, there is no greater inequality between those who control the money supply, who control the interest rates, who can sell off the unborn productivity of future generations for the sake of bribing people in the here and now. And this is inevitable with the state. This is not the state gone wrong. This is the state. You bribe people to get their votes, and you pay them off by selling off fetuses to Chinese bankers. It is unholy. And this is all over the world. There is no exception to this, particularly in democracies. And it's repetitive from the Roman Empire down to the present. You give people shallow entertainments, reality TV, Telemundo. <laughs> you give them this stuff, and you give them, you bribe them with printed money and borrowed money. And the power to do that is the greatest inequality. I cannot type whatever I want into my bank account. I've tried. It's a read-only field. Total bummer. 
but the government can do that. There's no greater power than the power to control money, the power to control interest rates, and the power to sell off the productivity of the unborn. And there is no equality that can come out of that moral and legal and philosophical inequality within society. Okay, well, um, I'd like to point just two questions. No? Uh, first, uh, about coercion. Uh, I believe, too, that we need to begin by definitions. No? And uh, <clears throat> I understand coercion as uh, something that you don't make by free choice. No? It means you must to accept. No? It's not a question of choice. No? If you accept this idea, for me, it's very complicated to say that, well, family is not a case of coercion or even religion is not a case of coercion. Or I would like to say uh, the, the process of constitution of individuality has a strong uh, measure of coercion. It means what I need to, to lost to be an individual, for example. What I need to accept to be an individual. Uh, if you put this kind of questions, I, I think that I prefer to say that uh, there is a several kinds of coercion. I can understand that the coercion that exists in the state is not the same coercion that exists in the family, but I would not, I would don't like, I don't like to accept that. Uh, well, there is no question of coercion in family. Uh, uh, maybe we need to to be uh, a little less, let's say, binary, and say, well, in some situations, family is a case of coercion. In some situations, the state is a case of coercion. In other situations, the family can can be a space where uh, I can learn things for freedom. No? And in some situations, the state can be a very strong and important actor in some fights, some social fights. No? Uh, then I I ask if the question is not uh, just uh, try to avoid. Uh, this kind of institutions, or if the question is try to have, let's say, a more complex view of what these institutions could do and could not do. No? Uh, this is the first question. The second is uh, I can understand all this, this, this point of view concerning the action of the state uh, as as a guarantee of equality. Yeah? I, I can understand uh, all these this <coughs> this positions that, that you put in the, in the debate. But I'd like to make a question. Uh, you came from Canada, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you st I, I, I believe that you studied in the public school. Uh, it was a mix, but uh, a lot of it was in a public school, yes. Public school, yes. And uh, what do you think about the public school? Uh, terrible. Why? Absolutely terrible. Why? Because I was never taught how to think. I was stuffed full of a bunch of propagandistic conclusions. Uh, the government is here to help. Without the government, there's chaos and murder. And uh, the government saved us all from the Great Depression. And the government saved us all from the Nazis. And without, you know, it was all just a bunch of conclusions. Mm. And I also found that this is all the way through. Uh, I uh, ended up got a master's degree from the University of Toronto. I studied at York University and McGill University. So I had a good tour. I was mm. in pu private school in England, public school here in Canada. And um, whenever you question the outright propaganda of the state, it becomes very hard. I was just talking about this, I'm sorry, very brief yeah. answer, but I was just talking about this with someone at dinner the other night, that um, there was in graduate school, this woman was in graduate school, she's like, oh, I don't know if I want to continue, because if you are in Canada and you say, um, uh, the, 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 the Great Depression was caused by the free market and it was, uh, the effects were ameliorated by the, uh, the New Deal uh, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and then capitalism was saved by World War II. If you say that, which is the complete opposite of the truth, uh, empirically and statistically and morally, but if you say that, then you don't have to footnote anything, because it's just like saying the world is round. You don't have to say footnote. Galileo said, you know, here's the math. You just say it because it's accepted. And and the the propaganda that is out there that is, I'm sure it's the same here. It's government schools are the same everywhere. 
but if you say something like the, um, the Great Depression was caused by the Federal Reserve jacking up the amount of money in circulation by two-thirds and then contracting it by a third, uh, and then massive amounts of government intervention, violent intervention in the economy kept things going, and the Second World War did not save capitalism. Capitalism was only saved by the fact that they dismantled all of the, the New Deal programs, almost all of them after the Second World War, and let the free market function. Uh, then you have to provide so many footnotes, and, and then people will say, well, this is not a reliable footnote. And I have 2,000 historians who are saying one thing, and you have five who are saying another, and so you don't get an A. You, you know? And so in this way, you, you just have this reproduction of this, this propaganda. I just, you know, I, I can't think of a single thing of, of significant or enduring value that I got out of public school. Um, I don't know if you guys feel any different. I mean, almost everything that I've got that is of real value in my life, I have learned outside of uh, formal education. Formal education for me was just uh, trying to navigate my way through to get the piece of paper and trying to bite my tongue as much as possible to the point where it was you know, half the size of my head when I was done. But do you think that propaganda exists just in public schools? Well, no, but like propaganda exists from Coca-Cola. We went to the zoo uh, the other day and uh, <laughs> here is the snake. By Coca-Cola, like I yes. don't think the snake was but built by Coca-Cola. I don't think it is made of Coca-Cola. So you were saying? Just, just one point: in Brazil, in private schools, you have to abide by the uh, government. Yeah, they're all the same regulations. Yeah. But the difference is with with an advertisement. I know that it's an advertisement, right? So when I say, uh, you know, if if uh, uh, when I was younger, I worked in a in a daycare, and we took all the children to a, a Coca-Cola factory to see how the Coca-Cola was made. And they played a commercial. I can't even remember the song, and you can count yourself happy. <laughs> but I don't, otherwise I would do karaoke night for sure. But, um, uh, and all the children were singing along. But if you were to say to them, if you were, say, if you were to say to the children, I'd ask them afterwards, I said, well, is this, is this true? Is this like a, a truth? Is this like good? Is this like right? And they said, no, it's tasty. You know, and, and I would also say, do the commercials tell the truth about Coke? Like, do they say it's bad for your teeth? Do they say whatever, right? They say, well, no, of course, they're trying to sell us Coke. <laughs> of course not. I mean, they, they're aware. I mean, everybody knows a commercial is a commercial. But people don't know that public school is a commercial. But that's the problem. That's, the prob that's why I call it yeah. propaganda rather than advertising. Yeah, but this is very funny because, for example, I always studied in private school. I studied here in the private school that learned me that for the French Revolution, was a show of murder, just this, just a show of murder. And I always said, look, I think that's not exactly the case. And they said to me, look, it's a private school, this is my school, if you don't believe, you need to go ahead. But there is no other place to go. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I can understand what are you saying. Uh, we, in, in the, this process, when we're in a public school, we need to accept some, some perspectives, some versions of the history that maybe is not really true. Uh, but uh, uh, this, the, uh, in the public system, nobody can say to you, look, if you are not agree, go ahead. Uh, you can discuss. Uh, but if you are just in the private system, you know, for example, uh, it's the same thing for, for if you were working for a private company, the people say, well, this is our values. If you don't believe in it, you need to go ahead. Okay, I mean, uh, I obviously can't speak to your education. I grew up uh, and I went to um, a private boarding school in England. And I can tell you for sure that the private boarding school in England was heavily influenced by the existence of the state, and in particular, the aristocracy. Private schools are there for the children. Let me be completely broad brush strokes. Uh, private schools are there for the education of the elite in order to have them run the society that exists. Not to create a new society, not to challenge the tenets of that society, but to step into the leadership roles of the society that exists. And so you can't be an anarchist in a private school. I'm an anarchist, right? So you can't be an anarchist in a, in a private school because they want you to go and, and run <laughs> society. And, and so they're grooming you for leadership in a society that you're going to benefit from because of the state, because of the power of the state. I mean, that would be my guess. I would also say, as, as you said, that they, they have to follow the curriculum. But the, it's very difficult to have a school and get parents to pay for a school that teaches the children the immorality that is at the root of the society that they live in. It's like, give me $10,000 a year so that I can make your children 
very uncomfortable in the society <laughs> that they live in. Um, somebody suggested a tagline for my show. Uh, I've run this philosophy show, Free Domain Radio. So Free Domain Radio, creating uncomfortable dinner silences since 2006. <laughs> because isn't this what philosophy does? I mean, this is what moral principles they do. And so I think it would be tough to sell uh, a, a private school in a society saying, well, yeah, we're going to teach you that law is an opinion with a gun. We're going to teach you that taxation is theft. We're going to teach you that national debts are a form of intergenerational enslavement. And go and enjoy your society. I don't know a lot of parents would pay for that, but that's because of the society that that exists. In fact, I think parents would pay not to have that. <laughs> you know, so so I, I'm not. I mean, I don't think you can really say private if they're trying to get people to adapt to a statist, irrational, aggressive, violent, hegemonic society. It's then you're just trying to adapt to to this this stuff, and I, it's not to me the same as a truly free education. Does that make any yeah, sense? But, 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 because I, I put this question because I would like to put actually another question. In your point of view, uh, how how, how service like uh, education and health need to work if you are totally against the state? Well, um, if, if I knew how they could work, I could be a great state. Um, <laughs> Like, so my argument is, uh, so uh, I'll give you a very short uh, analogy, then a, a, a bad answer. <laughs> Look forward to it. Uh, the, the short answer is it doesn't matter. Uh, it, we, we, you know, in, in America, in the South, uh, the slaves pick the cotton, right? The slaves pick the food. And if I say, we should not have slavery, people say, well, who will pick the cotton? Well, who will pick the food? I don't care. All I care is that slavery is immoral. I don't care who picks the slaves. I don't care who built the roads. I don't care how health care is provided. I just want people to stop using guns to run society, because it just runs it into the ground. It, it, you know, violence is like a drug. Uh, it's not like a drug. It is a drug. Uh, people become, I don't know, there's fantastic studies out recently. Uh, political power, power over other people through coercion, whether it's criminal or the state, whether it's uh, amateur criminals, or professional <laughs> criminals. Uh, it, is, uh, it releases dopamine in the system, uh, endorphins. It is more addictive than cocaine. And the, 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 they've done studies with monkeys, um, and politicians, no monkeys. Uh, and they, they have found that as monkeys move up in the social violent hierarchy, monkeys is a very aggressive hierarchy, uh, they get more dopamine, more endorphins. And then when they go down, they become depressed and inert and so on. It, 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 political power is incredibly addictive. It is, it, it, this is why we have people who are drug addicts fighting the war on drugs. It's, it's ridiculous, right? But um, so that, that's the, the very brief answer. I don't care. I, I do care that people, you know, I, I want people to stop shooting each other. I don't care if they hug or walk away from each other afterwards. Just put down the guns and then we can talk. But there's tons of examples of education. There's a fantastic, um, I've got a video series on YouTube called The Death of the West. Um, there was an example of education that was uh, in, uh, it's called the Lancaster School in the 19th century. You could get a full year of very high quality education. A lot of these people went on to higher education. Can anyone, give me a guess how much it cost? Give me a, give me a guess. 40,000? 80,000. 80, anyone else? This is in constant dollars. This is in modern dollars, reals, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, sorry, this is, um, yeah, it was about 80 US dollars, eight zero. And this, uh, the way that it occurred is, is you would have the, the older students would attempt to sell their tutoring services to the younger students, who in turn would attempt to sell their tutoring services to the younger students. So everybody was both a learner and a teacher. And you know that the best way to know if you know something is try to teach it to someone else, right? You ever try and teach the business cycle theory to someone else? They've got 10,000 questions, and you immediately know <laughs> when you don't know stuff. And so uh, this was a very, very effective and powerful form of education that was there. In the 19th century in America, literacy rate, 97%. 97%. This is a time when people consumed um, Herman Melvin, uh, Moby Dick. They, they consumed uh, Thomas Paine, The Rights of Man. They can, I mean, the, the, the democracy in America by de Tocqueville was a bestseller. This was a highly literate, highly educated population. Do you know there is no government school that has come even close to that? Uh, literacy rates in the United States right now? Do you have any idea how absolutely appalling it is? I mean, of course, I'm not saying you're in, you're in favor of any of this, but the, the lit literacy rates, even by government standards, 
and the government is like the opposite of standards, but even just by government standards, only about 30 to 40 percent of grade six, seven, and eight students are literate. I mean, it, it, it's catastrophic what, what yeah, is going on in, in government education, and uh, to me, this is the result of coercion. Coercion produces crap. You know, the only thing that is vo quality is is voluntary. Everything that is not voluntary is junk and and immoral, obviously, and, and disastrous in the long run. Yeah, but it's a little bit strange because what you don't you are not saying well without government <coughs> education you, you'll be better we just say i don't care you know? I, could you imagine the image for example you were saying well let's stop with the state let's stop with the ser social state social service and things like this and a poor family ask you well what will you do now you say i don't care it's a little bit i think it's, it's easy to just to say in this way you know? But I would hope that people would not want me to care because I, they shouldn't be reliant upon me for whether they do what they do. I mean, it, it, they, they shouldn't be anybody in society we go to and say, how will my life be run? Sa save me from X, Y, or Z. Uh, I mean, to the poor people, uh, I would say you're poor because of the state, uh, where we do not have the state. Uh, you know, in, in the United States, the least regulated profession is the computer industry, the software industry. How's that doing in terms of reducing prices, increasing quality? One of the most regulated fields in the United States is the healthcare industry. How's that doing? Catastrophic. Uh, constantly increasing costs. Uh, there is, I, I saw a presentation, I just came from Dallas and gave a talk there, a presentation by Dr. Mary Ruart. Uh, I really recommend looking her stuff up. She's estimated that upwards of five million Americans have died as a result of the FDA's control over drug approvals. Uh, the, the drugs that are perfectly legal in other countries that save hundreds of thousands of lives are banned. Uh, and so people say, well, how will my medicines be safe? That's assuming that they're safe now. Poor people say, well, how will my children be educated? They're not being educated now. In fact, it's worse than not being educated because they think they're being educated when they're not. And when you think you have a solution, that's worse than not having a solution. You know, it, you ever get that feeling you're driving, you're driving along, you know, maybe you don't have your GPS. Or maybe you can't drive with one knee, like <laughs> my friend who drives down here tonight. But you get that feeling, and you're like, I think I might be lost. You know, that's a good feeling. Because if you're completely confident <laughs> and you are lost, that's really bad. And so it's the illusion of an answer that the state gives. How are we going to deal with poverty? Point a bunch of guns at these people, take some money, print some money, and then we'll give some money to these people. Look, a problem is solved. It's, it's the illusion of a solution. How are we going to educate people? Well, we're going to force all of these children to go into these schools, and we're going to force all of these people to pay for it, and we're not going to allow competition. And if we do allow competition, it's by our rules and following our curriculum. And then we think we have solved the problem of education. That's like solving the problem of loneliness by forcing people to get married. You haven't solved the problem. You've just alleviated a symptom while making the problem worse. And so. When people say, well, how will problems be solved without the state? There's this illusion that violence is solving the problems now. It, it's not. It, it's, it's covering up a few symptoms. You know, as I say, it's like cocaine for a toothache. I feel better. But my tooth is only getting worse. And when it wears off, right, when we run out of money, when we can't pay our debts, when, you know, Greece, you know, Gre Greeks at the moment are taking a billion dollars out of the bank every day because they're terrified of what is going to happen. They're, Americans relied on the government to solve social problems. They have a $15 trillion debt, close to $100 trillion of unfunded liabilities. They just lost 40% of their wealth in four years. Was the government not big enough? It's the biggest government the world has ever seen. The United States government is the largest, most wealthy, most powerful government the world has ever seen. How's it going? Sorry. No, no, this is very funny, because uh, for me, it's funny to, to listen to this kind of perspective. Because, for example, when you funny, haha. -ha. Yeah, funny. no, no, no. <laughs> funny, <laughs> funny. <laughs> unexpected. Let's say uh, it's not. It's not exactly what I expect. Because, uh, for example, you say, well, you thought I was right wing. Sorry. You thought it was like right wing, like <laughs> okay. Yeah. You say, for example, well, uh, I would like to say to to a poor family, well, you we are poor because the state, eh? because the government, and uh, you use <clears throat> the uh, major examples that came from the United States government. Uh, and, well, I, I, I would like to say, as a vulgar Marxist, uh, something like, well, but the problem is that this government is not exa exactly uh, a public government. 
Is the government totally limited? You mean Brazilian? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, the, okay. the, the, the uh, American, American government. The government totally linked with major interests of major companies. Right? It means it's not exactly, it's not a public government, it's a private one. Sure. Uh, well, it's a, it's a system that, that the big companies u uh, use to, for example, to defend banks, as yeah. you, you said, yeah. uh, to defend some companies and things like this. But, for example, we can think in, in a more fair state. For example, well, uh, w w where are the people that, that have the, the lowest uh, difference between rich and poor? There, there is a, in countries that, that have strong states, like Sweden, like Denmark, like Finland, like Norway, like I Iceland, no, <laughs> but it's broken now. <laughs> but I think that you, you know uh, we can we can say well, how, why we have these examples? Mm. Because we have a kind of state that is not just a a, 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 a skill uh, mm. a skill of some major companies. Yeah, I mean, this uh, phrase in uh, economics is called regulatory capture, which means that when you, you know this, and, uh, but for those who don't, it's you're a bank and the government has the power to regulate you, and so you give a lot of money to politicians and you make sure that you get to write the legislation. I mean, the Obamacare, certainly the pharmaceutical aspects of it were written by the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, they pay massive amounts of money and uh, they give tens or hundreds of millions of dollars through various means to candidates. and. Uh, of course, the regulators, uh, if you are, let's say you're doing an MBA in finance and you're like the top 1% of your class, do you say, I can't wait to get a job at the SEC because they pay like $70,000 a year? No, you go and you create these crazy financial instruments that manipulate fiat currency, make you rich and destroy the world. And um, uh, so the, the, this is true statistically, the dumber people go into regulations, I mean dumber relative to, and the really smart people go in the industries, and so they can't keep up. I mean, it's just an intelligence differentiation. Uh, regulatory capture is a huge problem now. The Scandinavian examples, I mean, this is a long conversation, and we don't have to bore everyone, but um, uh, my fundamental question is, are they in debt? And of course they're in debt. And so it's sort of like, you know, you get up and you go to work every day, and I know, but because Every country in the world has a government. So every country in the world is in debt. But it's like you, you get up and you go to work every day, and you know there are times when you don't want to go to work. You got a headache or you know whatever. I right? didn't sleep well, and then your neighbor is just sitting there, you know, with this big cigar, a mojito, uh, eight o'clock in the morning. Can you believe it, right? And you're like, man, I'm a sucker. This guy's got it made. But all he's doing is living off his credit card, and it's going to crash. And so we can always find some government, right? I mean, that, oh, they seem to be doing much better. I mean, their inequality is lower and so on. Yeah, of course, because they're going into debt. And, but you'll find that their birth rates are usually very low, which is a huge problem for especially an aging population. We all know this, the baby boomers are going to retire. It's the same thing here. Did you get a post-war boom? And not so much, right? Because you didn't have a war, so that's good. Post-war boom, but only in Nazis. <laughs> they don't breed very much. They were all pretty old, right? But um, uh, so, yeah, if, if, if someone goes into debt, it looks like they've squared the circle. They've solved the problem. But the Norwegian countries are all massively in debt. They have extremely low uh, rates of, and so there's just no conceivable, they won't last another 20 years. This is absolutely unsustainable. Uh, going into debt and printing lots of money, and I mean, yeah, it looks like you've solved all these problems. I mean, why are the baby boomers in North America so rich? Because the government paid for all the stuff they should have paid for, like roads, like healthcare, like yeah, all this stuff was almost, was very cheap, was very free. They didn't have to pay for their aged parents because of social security. And so they got to save all this money for stuff they should have otherwise bought. And so they got all this money now, and they expect to get all this retirement money, but there's nothing in the bank, so all they're doing is feeding off the young, who are the poorest generation that has come along in a while. I mean, it's brutal. So yeah, I mean, it's no question you can find some state of society that seems to be doing okay, but the big question is, what's their per capita debt? What's their, what's their population bulge? I mean, this is just demographics and finances. If it's unsustainable, what's gonna change? I mean, none of the state of societies Canada has a higher per capita debt than Greece. This is not good company to be in. Now, we have some natural resources, and Greece has fewer, but, I mean, it's all completely unsustainable. And it wasn't sold to us as unsustainable. It wasn't like, hey, let's have a spending and bribing orgy, and we'll make lots of money, and then we'll stiff the next generation with the bill. It was sold as this was going to be sustainable. This was going to reduce costs. This wasn't going to be a problem. 
And so the people who founded the system were either fools or liars. Not that you can't be both. But um, yeah, you can find some company, some country that's working out, but uh, if it's got a, a small birth rate, an aging population, and debt, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, but what can, what can guarantee you that a society without state will be better than a society that we know? You know what, what, can, what can, let's say you end slavery, how can you, let's say we're the first people to talk about ending slavery, we'll go back 400 years. Right? We're the first crazy Quakers to talk yeah. about ending slavery, and people will say, well, how can you guarantee me that a non-slave owning society will be better? Show me an example of a non-slave owning society in the past. We say, well, we can't, because we're talking about it for the first time. But I think that this comparison is not a very good one. It means that you compare uh, for the slavery system with, a, uh, let's say, well, a democratic system. Well, at least the slaves could run away. I mean, what are the young people going to do when the debt comes, right? I mean, there's no place you can go. The, the slaves had an underground... I understand, I'm not saying that everyone here is exactly the same as an American slave. I'm just saying that the analogy is not completely outlandish. I mean, what is the per capita debt in Brazil at the moment? Anybody know? Yeah, like per capita debt, national debt. Oh, please don't make me do this. My, <laughs> let me take my shoes off and count my toes. And this is just current debt, unfunded liabilities, promises to people made for health care, for old age pensions, for no, this is probably... That's funded, funded uh, this that's is funded, okay. So, but it's going to be pretty significant. And um, the, the, I mean, we have no right to sell off the unborn. We, we just don't. I mean, uh, national debts are unbelievably immoral. And it is a form of enslavement. To be born into a system where you are loaded with tens or hundreds of thousands of rails of debt is a form of economic enslavement. It is an exploitation. Of the, of the unborn, which is even worse than the exploitation of the workers. But the workers, at least, they can maybe vote, or they can go to another country, or they can start a business, or they can start a union, which would be great. I mean, they can do all of these things, but the unborn have absolutely no say. To be born into debt is unbelievably unholy. And, and this is the case for all governments around the world. They're just selling off the unborn for the sake of bribing voters in the present. And if it's that universal, we've got to ask if there's something wrong with the system as a whole. If every single government is doing exactly the same immorality, at some point we have to say it's something wrong with the system as a whole. Not just, well, this government versus this government, but... And so uh, I think that it's perfectly valid. I mean, I guess, sorry, for one last brief example. I've used this before, but if we were talking 400 years ago about the end of slavery, and I were to say to you, I know exactly what's going to happen. I know, I'm going to tell you. Um, we're going to free the slaves. Now, right now, 90% of people are farmers or involved in agriculture. There's just a few people who aren't. But by the time this is done, 100 years, 200 years from now, only 3% of people are going to be involved in farming. And there will be these giant machines that go rolling through the crops with these huge robot arms that, that pick all the crops for you. Oh, and they run on the crushed trees of 300 million years ago. And they, this one guy can do a whole field in an afternoon that used to take hundreds of guys half the summer. And then they'll replant automatically. And then these giant rolling wagons with no horses will fly across this crushed rock <laughs> roads that, you know, and we would just go, and, and you would say to me, that's completely insane. I mean, that's not even science fiction. That's like a drug trip that you're talking about. That makes no sense. But that is actually what happened. The future beyond the veil of force, the future on the other side of peace, the future when we put the gun down, is unimaginable. So to try and predict it, say, well, who will build the roads? Who will do with the health care? It's like saying, who will pick the crops 200 years after the end of slavery? It can't be fathomed. But it will be fantastic. But look... I would like to think in the kind of uh, society where the state is not uh, exactly necessary. We're talking uh, about the withering away, this is the Marxist. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there is even a very strong leftist tradition uh, in the fight against the state. Uh, uh, but the question is, uh, we have a problem now. Uh, the problem is, for a society like this uh, uh, exist, uh, we must to put everybody in a kind of... Um, same level. It means, uh, for example, if you have today, we have a strong, strong structures of inequality. Then, if you just put the state away, this is will grow, just will grow up. 
uh, well, we saw it in other situations. We saw, for example, in the neoliberal politics, where the states were, were, were well, we, we, we put ahead of the state, yeah? and the, the inequality grew up. Okay, sorry, but what examples of this? Well, England was an example. Uh, uh, inequality in England grew up in the, f in the, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, for example, I have, uh, I, I remember, I, I remember the, the numbers. Uh, in 1970, uh, the one percent more rich in England had something like 0 0.5, no, f sorry, 2.3 uh, of the income of the country. Yeah? Today they have 5.3, 5 .3, 5 .3, and in, in 230 they must have something like 40 percent. That means uh, our historical Uh, I, I could I could accept your idea that well uh, we must to to give uh, the responsibility responsibility to individuals, <coughs> but what we say until today, what you see until today is not really really good. No, it's not. Okay, yeah, that's a great point. So uh, if I want to make sure I understand the argument, so when we've seen situations where there is some restriction in the size and power of the state, or maybe even a diminishment, that you get increased inequality. Uh, you can look at uh, what happened in Reagan's America, where they cut taxes and so on, uh, Thatcher's uh, England and so on, where there is a shrinkage in the state caused by uh, a rise in inequality. Um, but two, two arguments. It doesn't matter if you cut taxes, it matters if you cut spending. The problem with Thatcher and Reagan is that they cut taxes without cutting spending, which means that they just run into debt. And when you run into debt, you have to go borrow money. Now, the government doesn't come to us, right, <laughs> when it needs $10 trillion, right? It doesn't come to you and I say, listen, with the change jar, uh, listen, can you chip in a little because we need uh, 100 billion reals to cover the budget? No, they go to the monster capitalist. Can I say a nasty word now? They go to the monster capitalist people who aren't very nice with holes. And uh, they go to those people, and then those people give them money to, to cover up and then they end up paying a lot of money back to those people, right? You know the income tax in America? Does everybody know where the money goes from the income tax? All the income tax in America goes where? Does it go to social services? Does it go to roads? Does it go to hospitals, police? Just goes to pay interest on the debt. It doesn't even go to pay the debt. It only goes to pay interest on the debt. So if you cut government taxes without cutting government spending, then you have to borrow money from these banksters, and then the rich end up getting very rich, because now they own 20-30% of Americans, 20-30% slavery to financiers who have lent the government money because the government wanted to cut taxes without cutting spending. And when you cut taxes, of course, you proportionally benefit the rich because the rich pay more in taxes, and so this is not a good way to solve the problem of the state. That's the first thing. The second argument I would make is I always find it fascinating to look at these patterns. Look at the Roman Empire at the very beginning, very small government relative to the end. To the end, it was just another fascist dicta dictatorship. But at the beginning of the Roman Empire, what did, they, what did they get so wealthy from? From free trade and a small government. Look at the beginning of the American government. Okay, sorry about women, sorry about slaves, but looking at, and it's not small, it is big important issues, but if you look at the size of the government and the degree of control it had over trade, it was tiny. No income tax, no sales tax. You could, you could go and, and do whatever you wanted. Go be a doctor, go be a plumber, go be a lawyer. You didn't have to have all these uh, licenses and no tariffs, a few tariffs, and, uh, but there was nothing. And, and it, it, it grew unbelievably. It, it grew unbelievably in terms of its economy without rising prices. Do you know that the average price of commodities at the end of the 19th century in America was lower than at the beginning? I mean, we just used the prices going uh, 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 up, 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 right? It's cheaper at the end than at the beginning. But the problem, and sorry, the last, the, Amer the, the British Empire, where, uh, England, how did it become a world power? Because England was the first country to institute free trade with other countries in the, in the 18th century, 17th century. I, I believe it or not, I've read these books. It's amazing. There's incredible arguments that they made for free trade, saying it was going to be incredibly beneficial. So they freed up their, the Corn Laws reduced uh, uh, agricultural subsidies and controls. None of this stuff is new. But what happens? The Roman Empire has free trade and it has great transportation and a small government. So you get a lot of wealth. And what does the government do when it sees a lot of wealth in society? It starts to raise your taxes, right? Freedom breeds tyranny. 
the free when you are as long as you have a government when you have a small government it, you will get a large government it is food for cancer freedom is food for the cancer of the state the british empire free trade lots of wealth massive growth in taxation america went from the very smallest government that had ever been conceived of in the history of our species to the very largest government that has ever existed it could even have been imagined in the history of our species and so uh, my concern is that, yeah, if you shrink government, what you're doing is you're creating a huge amount of potential energy and potential wealth that the government starts to tax. When the citizens become more wealthy, the government uses that wealth as collateral to borrow and enslave and indebt the next generation. As long as you have a government, whatever you do to compress that government, if you're not compressing it to nothing, it just blows up and takes over everything. Sorry, that's a some brief answer. No, no, I can understand your argument. In, in when, when, I, when I say that it's funny, it's because I remember, for example, some, some leftists like Pierre Clast that uh, had written a book uh, called Society Against the State. The Society Against the State. And, uh, and the arguments are not really different of your arguments, too. But uh, what, what we see, for example, when you say, well, the question is not just cut, cut taxes. The question is just cut spending. Uh, but when you see the governments that are cutting spending, what they cut? They cut spending in education, they cut spending in, in, in hospitals and money for the old people. Uh, like, for example, we are saying, we are seeing this now, today, yeah. in Europe, for example. And uh, it's very complicated to, to, to even try to imagine it, uh, how we can cut spending without destroy all this, this service that are totally important for people. Well, you stop paying interest on the debt. You, you screw the banksters. Save the people. Screw the banksters. I mean, you, you, you stop. Hey, well, yeah, this, agree. we agree. Wait, I mean, wait. but this is but this but governments can't do that. I mean, there's a reason why they don't do that. They don't do that because if they make. I'm trying to keep my language. It's a family show. Hi, hi. But if we we. Uh, it's hard to speak clean. <laughs> But uh, the, the governments can't do that because if they do not get the debt servicing, if, they, if their debts are called in, uh, they, what are they going to do? Yeah, this is very funny. For example, I saw, I don't know if you are, uh, uh, what you think about, for example, this Republican candidate, Ron Paul. Oh, Ron Something Paul? Like uh, hugely dangerous, in my okay, opinion. Okay. Yeah, hugely no, dangerous. No, because it was the, the only that... Cool? Yeah. He's a cool guy. Yeah. A doctor, a politician, yeah. Austrian economics guy, yeah. but... Uh, uh, sorry, just if you. No, because he was the only that says something like like what you say. Uh, yes. Well, I have some issues. He believes in states' rights, you know, because this government really bad, this government really good. I mean, this just doesn't. Mean, <laughs> you know, this cancer is bad, but this local cancer yeah, it's good, it's healthy. But uh, you know, I mean, I think for Ron Paul, the, the the first of all, I mean, he's very religious, and I think that's that's a problem. I mean, if you're looking for rational, consistent thought. Yeah. Uh, but I think the, the great danger of Ron Paul, imagine, you know, uh, the way I sort of view it is you're second in command on the Titanic. Uh, let's say I'm the captain and you're second in command. I feel something, right? And I go down and I, I look at the bottom of the ship. It's, you know, water coming in, Leonardo DiCaprio running around. And, and then I come back up and I say, listen, I would, uh, I would like to give you a promotion. I'm going to put you in charge and you're going to be the captain. And you're like, Yay! And then all the history books say, you went down with the Titanic. You were the captain in charge when the Titanic went down. Uh, if you are into freedom, you stay away from this Hindenburg at the moment. Because if Ron Paul got elected, I mean, the system can't sustain itself, no matter what anybody does now. I mean, we're just trying to find ways to get to the next thing after this thing stops. But all people would remember is, you remember that libertarian who got in, Ron Paul? Well, when he got in, you know, he, all the spending got cut, and, and, and people were out rioting in the streets, and, oh, remember what libertarianism, I mean, they're still blaming the Great Depression on the free market. I mean, they, this would kill freedom philosophy for a thousand years if this guy got in power, uh, because it would take that long to get over, I mean, he's a well-meaning guy, a nice guy, a smart guy, but stay away from that Titanic right now. <laughs> you know, you can only have credibility if you're not in charge when the thing goes down, I think. That's why I'm not president. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If you feel that bump, you start edging towards the lifeboats and you know save as many people as you can. Do we have uh, too many questions from the brains of the outfit out there? Concerning Rob Rob Paul, but then you say he doesn't have a, like a formula to fix the things. Uh, 
libertarian ideas only goes well when the system, when you are in the cruise mode, when you read, when you hit a, a rock, doesn't work? Well, if let's say that Ron Paul got in, he would have to be prepared to use force. He would have to, because he would be cutting a huge amount of social spending. Uh, I, I think that's irresponsible. I think people are dependent on the system. I don't think you can just change society in that fashion. Uh, and, but he would have to be prepared to use force. So he would try and privatize schools or, or maybe, I mean, I know that's not directly, but he would try and privatize stuff or cut spending. Uh, people would go out in the streets, they would riot. He would have to bring out the police. He'd have to bring out rubber bullets. He'd have to bring out the National Guard. You'd see blood on the streets. Uh, I mean, I've, I mean, this is what happens. I mean, in, in, in Quebec, they're talking about raising tuition about $150 a year uh, in, in a province in Canada, just trying to get it back to how much they used to pay in 1960. And there have been riots and deaths. I mean, in Wisconsin, they're talking about asking people to pay a few percentage points of their retirement benefits, and you have riots and death and recall elections. Uh, people are not philosophically ready for a free society. They can't even... The conceive of it as a free society, of a non-violent society. So, yeah, if Ron Paul were to get in, he would have to use force. Now, let's say he was willing to use force, and let's say by all miracles he achieved his goals, and we collapse the state back down to 10% of its current size. You would see a huge explosion of wealth in society, lifting the poor, as statistically happened after the Second World War, when the free market was relatively free. Poverty was declining 1% every year, every year. And then the welfare state went in, and it stopped declining, and now it's increasing again. Um, but all that would happen is if he got what he wanted, we'd collapse the state back down, there'd be a huge growth in um, uh, revenue, uh, in, in income, and people would be making hundred, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 a year. What would the government do? Money, 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 tax, 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 collateral. And so the government would simply grow even bigger than it had before. And I don't think this can go on forever. I and mean, eventually the government's going to get so big and technology will get so advanced that we simply won't be able to fight it anymore. So I don't think this process can go on forever. Does that, I think I may have answered your question, is that yeah. anyway close? Or I don't want to say, when I say I answered your question, I don't mean that, ah, that's the final, you know, ah, I'm just saying that's my answer. Yeah, I, I think that Ron Paul's program, <coughs> he wouldn't cut the social security or things like that, that for people that are dependent on the system. He, he, he would cut more in the military and the uh, war on drugs, things like that. Uh, well, at least from, from what I remember, he wouldn't cut those social stuff immediately. He would do it the transition process. Uh, so. Yes, no, I understand. Yeah, I'm not saying that he'd like old yeah. people on the streets, but I mean, it's really tough to cut spending in a social welfare system because yeah. let's say he fires a whole bunch of people from the military while well, they just go on unemployment insurance. He hasn't actually saved any money. Yeah, but when you uh, unregulate the economy, then you have more jobs and you know, you put out the regulations. So I think there, there, is, there could be a transition. I agree with you that if we maybe shrink the size of the state, then they would use that wealthy and maybe to buy a new technology, people would get in, into the government and, you know, control Yeah, I mean, more, yeah. where he would have the most luck, and I think where he would have the best chance, would be to uh, get rid of regulations, yeah. right, to get rid of barriers to entry. You know, if we, we want to help the poor, we want to make sure the poor can very easily become uh, skilled people, yeah. right? So if, if it takes you seven years of staring at some other guy fixing toilets to become a plumber, that's a huge barrier for the poor. We want to make sure, hey, you want to be a plumber? Go be a plumber. I don't care, you know? I mean, if you blow up people's toilets, they'll be upset with you and you won't be a very good plumber anymore. But, you know, go, go be a plumber. Just reduce the barriers to entry. I mean, there's places in the States, you, you have to have a license to be a flower arranger. Because, you know, you put that rose next to the two, <laughs> right? So I think in that instance, yeah, if he's, if he's about breaking down regulations, but the problem, of course, is that whenever you try to break down restrictions and regulations, everyone who's benefiting from it yeah. goes insane, yeah. right? I mean, the sugar tariffs, I mean, just tiny examples, sugar tariffs make people millions of dollars every year by re restricting imports of sugar. And so people, it raises the price of sugar in the U.S. to the point where they end up putting this god-awful stuff, fructose, glucose, mm -hmm. everywhere because it's not regulated and so people get fat and you know, it's all these terrible things that happen. But the reason that these things go on decade after decade after decade is that, as you know, if you try to cut sugar subsidies, then every consumer has like 20 bucks worth of incentive because <laughs> that's how much it costs each consumer a year, 20 or 30 bucks. They have almost no incentive yeah. 
to support you, but the sugar consumers, so the sugar producers who are making millions of dollars, will go hire lawyers and make ads and and run negative ads. And so politicians just don't touch it, right? So, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they, they buy. So, yeah, whenever you have this regular, it's called rent seeking, right? Whenever you have this regulatory control, the people who benefit from it will just go destroy your political career uh, if, uh, if you try and take away their unjust money. And it's this huge bounce. So, I don't know what would happen in that situation, but I think it's a lot easier to talk about cutting regulations than achieving it. But that's a great point for clarity. Thank you. very clearly so, uh, uh, would you still uh, be willing to defend that aggression to solve society's problems through aggression? Be uh, the question is, I don't believe that the state is just aggressive against people. No? I think that there is a, a kind of ambivalence in, the, in some uh, political state, state politics. No? For example, I can accept that some state politics are very aggressive because they are made, they are, they, they are made by Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Special interest, something like this. But for example, I, I can, I can identify some kind of politics, uh, state politics that are benefit for people. Uh, for example, that's some kind. For example, we have problems concerning trustees. Uh, well, if you, you, you don't have some kind of power that could uh, break some trustees, uh, even the idea of a free market is finished. Uh, then, but the question is, who can do this? Uh, which kind of power can do this? Uh, for example, we have our Brazilian economy. We have uh, a, a very good example here. You, uh, you refer to antitrust? For example, antitrust laws. Uh, mm -hmm. And for, we have our econ economy is a totally trusty economy. Every sector is, 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 is made by two or three companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, uh, well, airlines and, and, and things like this, you know, but the, uh, you, you could say, well, but these companies, they are in the state. Uh, for example, they are in the state, they, they are in the, the regulatory uh, uh, councils of the state. We're right, sure. But the question is, well, I would like to fight for a regulatory system that is really regulatory not just expression expression of uh, some interest and more strong interest in the society. No? Uh, in this case, uh, well, I, I, we have examples. For example, in some situations, the state was able to do this. No? Why? Because we, ha we had a kind of a strong uh, a so a social uh, um, power. Uh, for example, uh, well, when, when the syndicates, when the trade unions were strong and things like this, they could uh, put the state uh, uh, in, in, in some, in some, let's say, in some line, uh, or put say, put some politics in some lines, uh, and uh, I believe in it. Uh, I believe in it, and I, but I, I can understand this idea that uh, what is better for us. Better for us is a situation where, well, the individuals, where well, situation where the civil society could decide for itself. Uh, um, I, I'm totally, I totally agree with it, but I think. Well, the first step to do this is changing this political structure. For example, uh, I believe that our liberal democracy are not able to do this. I believe that we need to go to a kind of, uh, let's say, plebiscitary democracy, uh, a democracy where, well, this this use, the continuous use of the the, the, co the public opinion uh, could could just could really works. Uh? And uh, I don't believe, for example, in the kind of democracy like we have today, where a parliament and things like this, I think that we need to go to a kind of directly part uh, uh, pop popular uh, expression. Uh? And we have the, uh, let's say, we have the, the, the technology for this today. Uh? But uh, I don't think that you solve the problem of monopoly by ca creating a state. What? You, I don't think you solve the problem of monopoly by creating a state, because a state is a monopoly. 
right? You, you can't solve the problem of a concentration of power by creating the ultimate concentration of power. You say, well, this company is going to get too much economic power, so to control that concentration of power, I'm going to create a state with the monopoly of taxing and policing and law and military and jails and courts. And I mean, this doesn't solve the problem. It's like saying I, I have a headache, so a guillotine will, <laughs> you know, well, well, I guess you won't have the headache, but only because you won't have the head, right? So it is a challenge. We don't want accumulations of power in society tend to be not good. I mean, I'm, I'm completely with you on that. But um, the only in, in a free market, again, this is a future fantasy, uh, but in a free market, you can only become economically powerful or significant by pleasing your customers. Because you can't use the government to force people to buy your product or to force, like, Microsoft has these monopoly patents. I mean, monopoly patents is just another form of government. It's just wretched, uh, these, these things. Uh, and uh, Apple has them too. And it, all you have now is companies fighting each other over patents. And, tr and it, it's just, it, there's a term for it, a patent troll. Somebody just buys up patents and sits on them to, so they can sue people. I mean, this is crippling for the industry as a whole. And so uh, the best way to avoid a concentration of power is, first of all, not build a state because that has a concentration of power that is then used by everybody else to, uh, to, to enhance their own economic power, to have a completely free market. Because, and let's say that you are a, um, uh, in the 19th century, you, are a, you have a monopoly on horses and carriages. You know, let's just say it's a free market, you build the best stuff, but then people don't like you or whatever. But then the car comes along and the horse and carriage is done. Or let's say you have a monopoly on the telephone, well, somebody comes along and invents the internet. Or you have a you know, monopoly, and there's always something new that comes along and, and breaks up a monopoly. <coughs> to my knowledge, and I've studied this extensively, though not exhaustively, there's never been an example of a free market monopoly. The, to my knowledge, without using state power, without using state coercion, it is, this is also true that there's no example in history of customers complaining about a monopoly. Because a monopoly is only a monopoly because it's pleasing the customers. Uh, the only people who bring complaints about a monopoly, who, who drive the regulatory process, the Sherman Antitrust Act and all the regulations that are supposed to break up monopolies, anyone guess who complains about a monopoly? Is the other companies who can't compete. It's never the customers. The customers never phone up the government. They never write to the government and say, I don't like this company. Well, I did this. <laughs> but you can't drive policy. Right? I mean, it, there are some people who write. And what the companies you're talking about, did they have state control, power, uh, for protection? The okay, for the company, uh, uh, airline companies and things like this. Do they not have state contraction oh, or control? Yeah. yeah. They are totally state, le, le, quasi fascistic <laughs> corporate, mm, bleh, right? Yeah. yeah, but I mean, historically, it's not, it's not a letter writing campaign from the, pub, from the public in the free market that, that creates these antitrust. It's the other companies. Uh, you know, Adam Smith said he's right, you know, businessmen never get together for more than five minutes without hatching a conspiracy against the public. And that's very true. But it's very hard to get that conspiracy into effect unless you can control the government, which is what companies first want to do. I mean, if you create the government to protect you from the rich, the rich aren't stupid. What's the first thing they do? Ah, <laughs> let's get control of the government. And that way we can completely eliminate alternate solutions. Uh, so, I mean, it's tempting. I mean, I, I get it. I, I mean, it's really tempting to say, you know, that old saying, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We've got a problem in society. We've got this big government, so let's have the government solve it. We've got a problem with, you know, I mean, nobody ever talks about how, you know, they get, I think it was Rockefeller who, who had Standard Oil, right? Nobody ever talks about how Rockefeller saved the whales. Anybody know that? It's interesting. I mean, you never hear about this, it's counter, but before he, he made the price of kerosene come down like 90%, he was an incredibly efficient capitalist in a good way. And before, did anyone know what they used before kerosene? Whale oil. I mean, the whales were almost done. Capitalism saves the whales. I mean, it's, it's a funny thing. You don't hear about this. And then, of course, government takes over giving licenses to hunt whales, and the whales are almost gone. And in Brazil, the antitrust uh, proceedings, uh, the government uh, runs questionnaires to uh, the suppliers, the, 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 the company clients, and the competitors. So that's, that's how it works. Yeah, and the competitors always because want the government to break up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because they can't compete, and so they, they want to break up the monopoly. Um, or you see, do you remember um, uh, Microsoft got into all this trouble with antitrust regulations? Uh, this was because they were bundling Internet Explorer for free with the operating system. Um, but this is because a lot of people who were very rich and powerful lost a lot of money on Netscape stock, and they got really angry. Uh, so they used this to punish it. IBM went through the same thing. 15 years of, of antitrust laws being slammed against them. They lost all their innovation. Uh, so anyway, I mean, 
uh, it's very tempting to think that we can solve the problem of a concentration of power by creating the most powerful concentration of power and then having it set the rules, you know, like you have a, a referee or some, an umpire or something, but this is, it doesn't work uh, because the rich take it over, uh, it's all politically motivated and, uh, you know, why do they cut spending for the, the poor guy uh, on welfare? Because he's not giving them a million dollars for their campaign. The, the poor in a status welfare system, the poor do very badly because there's, their power is all diversified and diffused, but the power of the rich and, and the corporations is very concentrated in that system. But maybe we have another problem too. Maybe free markets is an impossible idea. Because, uh, uh, look, for example, I never saw a free market. Well, there's no such thing as an impossible idea. Um, you've never seen a free market? Well, we no. have, I think we have one here tonight. A free market simply means no coercion. And nobody's here by coercion, as far as I understand it. I don't see any chains <laughs> from the, <laughs> the videographers. Yeah, but, but look, you. but this is not a market. I'm, I, I this is a market. I'm, I'm not Time is money. No, I'm not saying I'm not here to sell. I mean, yeah. but no, time is money, right? I mean, you guys could have been doing anything but else with your night. Maybe you're thinking that would have been a better idea. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, but but this is a, this is a voluntary association. Now we're not actually exchanging money but here. We're exchanging a, time and ideas. It's a, it's a very it's a very bizarre way to use the idea. You know, it means uh, every non-coercive situation is a free market. I, I well, don't no, think what so. I'm saying is For there's example, no fundamental... Marriage, there's no, it's not a free market. But there's no fundamental distinction between this, if we were exchanging money or ideas or time, it is still an exchange of something. It's very strange for me. I know, I know, but what I'm saying is that... So let's say that I sold everyone a book here. How is that fundamental? still no coercion. There's, still, there's no fundamental difference between exchange of ideas and, and, and money and bodily fluids, <laughs> whatever, I mean, that it, it's still just, there's still no gun in the room, there's still no force in the room, nobody's yeah. passing laws, nobody's sending people to jail, nobody's threatening, uh, so uh, I would say that this is a free market of ideas, uh, the fact that we don't exchange yeah, money but, doesn't matter. But not every situation uh, without coercion is a, is a potential free market situation. For example, uh, let's say, well, I married with my wife and in an no, absolutely non-coercive situation, but this is not, this is not a, a potential free market. Did she not choose you from a bunch of other people? Did you no, not choose her from a bunch of other people? What, you were nuns or <laughs> priests no, and nobody? No, but, this is not, but, look, but there's a market in dating. Is that not fair? When we advertise with uh, makeup and, and uh, beards. Uh. This is very funny because I, I remember this Kantian idea, for example, concerning mar marriage, eh? where, where Kant, Kant, for example, said, well, the marriage is a contract. Eh? The contract when I have the right to use the sexual organs of the, of the other. I, I think your wedding vows were yeah, not so very romantic. Okay. Yeah. Well, very <laughs> I had the sole yeah. right of exclusive use of. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the question. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I remember, for example, for example, the Regalian criticism yeah, when Regal said, "Look, we cannot think that well, uh, a marriage is a contract because if it is the case, I can call the police and say, well, my wife does not want to make sex with me. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have rights.' But this is the. But why can't uh, tough that that a marriage is a contract?" Well, first of all, sorry, you can dissolve a union, you can dissolve a marriage for no, no sex. Yeah. Sure, right? I mean, sure, so, sure. and that's very expensive. I mean, it's, it's sure. costly to do because the government runs it. Sure. It's costly to do. It has, you know, very negative repercussions sure, to everyone. Sure, so, sure. Um, I'm not saying that because... So, the, my, my only question is maybe we cannot uh, use the idea that every potential inter, intersubjective relations is a kind of free market one. No, and I'm not saying this is exactly the same as the stock exchange. I mean, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I was using an analogy. You say, I've never seen a free market. And I was defining, uh, we, we started originally with society, with social. And I was saying that that which is not coerced is social. Um, so here we have a voluntary association. Yeah. Right now, it doesn't happen to be a voluntary association with money, although money is involved. I mean, if I had, you know, I mean, some people subsidized me coming down here and, and all that, and I'm giving up other opportunities, as are you, to go and work as a fry cook at McDonald's and make <laughs> however much they make or whatever, right? So there is money that's involved. Even if we just look at the deferment of income we have by being here and talking with each other, there is an economic aspect to almost everything, which doesn't mean that everything is just cold and calculated and money-based, but what I'm talking about is that this is a voluntary association. And that is where it has value. If people were forced to be here, it would be no fun to talk to them, right? If you were with a ball and chain, well, then I would obviously have a very compelling example of what, I, <laughs> what yeah, I'm sure. talking about. But it has value because it's voluntary. And I think that this is an example of a society that is voluntary, that is 
I think quality is, is yeah, good. Yeah, but my question is, I never saw this, this voluntary association in market situations. It's a, a, for me, it's a kind of abstraction. It's a really abstraction. It's a, a Sorry, do you mean you've never seen it in its... Sorry? I would say pure, when you say something in its pure form, it sounds like it's unattainable, so I, I don't exactly know how to say it. But what you mean is you've never seen people exchange value economically in a free situation. Never. Yeah, never. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. In the same way that when the world, when agriculture was run by slavery, you would never have eaten a piece of fruit that wasn't affected by slavery, for sure. But that doesn't mean we can't have that. It just means it's not here now. I agree with you. There, I mean, I can't think, because, you know, I mean, it's crazy. I just read the statistic, between a th depending on how you measure it, between one third and half of the world's economy is outside the state. Is a black market, is a gray market, is money under the table, uh, and so on, right? I mean, this is crazy. How horrible to, to live without any recourse to the rule of law. I mean, this is wretched for, for workers, for everyone. It still functions, but that's not a free market because it has to be on the run from the government all the time. So you can't have open contracts. You can't have uh, any of that. Uh, you can't have enforcement. This is very funny because it's, it's something like, for example, I have com uh, com some communist friends. And and they said something to me. I think comrades. Yeah, is, uh, yeah comrades. It's the word <laughs> you have to use there. <laughs> and my, my communist comrades, they said, look, the communists never, we never had the experience of a real communist state. Yeah? But, but we can reach it. Yeah? And this is funny because, for example, you said something like, we never had the experience of a free market situation, but we can reach this. Well, okay, but the, no, I understand that, but there's a bit of a difference. There's a lot of a difference. So first of all, um, they got close in terms of the government control over the means of production, and the government was supposed to reflect the will of the workers. They got real close. And as they got closer, things got way worse, right, in the, in the socialist economies for reasons that are dull and technical, but mostly to do with von Mises' uh, explanation of the... Uh, the the price problem right there you without prices you can't efficiently allocate resources the calculation problem thank you uh, so uh, as we got closer to communism things got worse and worse and worse uh, uh, whereas as we got closer to a free market things got better and better and better I mean in terms of I mean you look at history right I mean you look at the GDP or, or per capita okay. income of history is <laughs> now the the industrial revolution was not a free market I mean you had uh, the, 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 the most efficient murderers were the aristocracy and they owned the land because they were the best killers, the best hired thugs of the state. And so you had this concentration of capital in the hands of, frankly, the most evil people in society because land was capital back in the day. They threw all the people off the land to concentrate the enclosure movement of this is not a free market situation. Uh, in, um, uh, in the uh, Industrial Revolution itself, you had a skewing of government policy towards the rich and the wealthy and the capitalists because they paid more in taxes than the individual <coughs> workers. You also had the Spenum land system of uh, welfare state in the south of England that was just terrible and devastated the workers to the point where their incomes actually declined while the workers in the north where there was not a welfare state, their incomes tended to go up and up. And everyone looks at the south and says, well, that was the free market. But the south of England was a welfare state. North of England was not. And their wages doubled while the south was just terrible. Uh, and uh, this is why I mean, the north is uh, well, it's still different even now than it was in the past. But as we get the free market, and you can see this both in time and also slicing through society. Right, so in time, you can see, well, was there more of a free market? Was there an income growth? I mean, look at what's happening in, in pre-free market relative uh, uh, China, right? Up until the 90s, uh, they were communist, uh, catastrophic, uh, just devastating. Their uh, GDP, and they've got these ghost cities, they've got this crazy fascistic central planning that's still running a bunch of the economy, but look at India, look at China, uh, these countries, as they began to respect private property and embrace the free market, as less and less violence was used in economic interactions, you know, they're sailing. This is a very funny. My communist comrades, you said to you yeah. three things. <laughs> the first thing, well, uh, the communist idea was lost when Lenin stopped with the idea of Soviets. Then everything that came uh, <clears throat> after, we, we, they said it's not communism. The second, the second question is, when you said, well, when the, we, we reach, we are near from free market, the things go better, how, what, what, I can, what I can think, well, for example, Reagan, Thatcher, and so on. Uh, what, but yes, but they, 
they did not cut regulations, they did not cut spending. Yeah. They only cut taxes, which but benefits the rich. Me, we talked about that. An example. What, what are, well, are um, about feudalism to industrialization. Feudalism, there was no free market. I mean, you were a serf tied to your land. You couldn't compete, you couldn't capitalize, mm. you couldn't industrialize, you couldn't automate. Mm. Uh, catastrophic. Uh, and then you start to see the respect for private property begin to emerge, mm. and some equality, and so on. Um, but the thing is, yeah, Lenin, yeah, he got rid of the Soviets. And then he had to introduce the new economic plan because they were all starving to death. But you cannot have a system where one bald guy changes his mind and it all falls apart. You know, that's not a good system. I rely on the integrity of one guy, and if that guy changes his mind, the whole system is toast. I don't want that. that. That cannot work. It cannot ever be reliant on the whims of one guy or ten guys or a hundred guys or a thousand guys. It has to be the individual choices of everyone. That is the third only way to I'm balance not defending power. Here the no, I'm just, this is what I would say to the comrades. The third, third point, when you use, for example, uh, examples like India and China, you could say, look, but uh, this is not a question of well, China has came, is, is, is became a free market society and then the things go better. We can say uh, a very different thing. For example, we said this is a hybrid society. Yeah? It's a state capitalism. And it, this is state ca capitalism is going better. Yeah, the capitalist part is going better. The state yeah. part is not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, but, the, but the capitalist part is going better. Yeah. Look, I mean, if, if you have some giant tumor and somebody gives you a medicine and the medicine starts going into your body, well, you're not better right away. I mean, you're just starting to get better. And and so, yeah, I mean, the, the state is the tumor and the free market is the cure. And uh, so if you start to, oh, well, there's still tumor. Well, yeah, there's still tumor, but it's, you know, it's better. And and so, my yeah, that, that would but be my look, argument. We, we, can, we, can, we can say the opposite thing. Huh? Exactly the opposite. Go ahead. Well. Say it backwards, though. Well, the free market is the, <laughs> free market is the disease and the, the state structure is the but they were no, 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 no. China was not a capitalist country, and then the state arrived, and then got better. The opposite. Yeah. No, no, but look, yeah, because China if you look at GDP society. growth, yeah, if you look at GDP and yeah. and wealth, uh, it, look, wealth is not the only measure. I understand that, but it's an important one. It's necessary, but not sufficient for freedom and happiness. Uh, and to your point about poverty, I, I completely agree. But I mean, the statistics are very clear. I mean, when they liberalize the economy, which simply means stop using guns as much. It's not the end of guns, yeah. because they're not a free society, of course, right? Neither are we, neither are you, neither are anyone, right? Neither is Somalia. But uh, it is, uh, it, less guns means more uh, increase in, in wealth. Look, I, I don't want to make here the defense of China or the Soviet Union. It's not no, my, no, of course, my, my no. position. But uh, using your argument, for example, in the 50s, uh, the, the country that grew uh, up in the most strong way was Soviet Union. The country that grew up? That grew economically? Yeah, yeah. It was Soviet you, Union. If you, you trust really, Soviet you, statistics. But, but you have the numbers. Uh, no. Yeah, okay. But, okay, but you know, it, it's very complicated to discuss. If you say, no, the numbers were just a, uh, just a, a force, uh, just the some truth. No, okay. Well, okay. I mean, we can... I don't know if it's going to be at all interesting. We'll just touch on it very briefly. But, okay, so Russia in the 50s, industrial espionage was unbelievable. I mean, the amount of uh, money, the, the amount of intellectual capital uh, that they stole. Uh, and, of course, the West was still subsidizing quite heavily. Uh, I remember grain shipments going from Canada over to the USSR quite a bit. Um, so uh, they were um, uh, they were stealing a huge amount of stuff. They were being given a huge amount of stuff. Uh, and, of course, they were slaughtering as you know, you know, millions of their own population. Uh, so, you know, stealing, charity, murder, I just can't see that being the basis of a society that we can say, well, look, they were growing. Well, you know, you know my belly grows when I have gas. That doesn't mean that I'm, you know, yeah, I'm doing just well. one part of the history. Sorry, let me just shift a little here. Uh, sorry, just kidding. <laughs> but even if they were growing, even if they were growing, the growth is not the ethics. I'm not a consequentialist. I'm not like, well, if we get the growth, then it's good, right? Um, when you free slaves, the economy goes down because everything's got to reallocate, right? And, and the, the farmers aren't happy because now they got to pay for what they got for room and board before. So when you free the slaves, the economy gets worse. And uh, when you encourage women to be equal in relationships and not yeah, put up with abuse, you get a lot of divorce, I, I and that's hard, this, right? Uh, I have a little, little bit afraid of this kind of argument, because, for example, we had we have this, this example in, in Chile. Yeah? Uh, well, I, I was born in Chile, yeah? Yeah, yeah. and I, I always listen to this, this idea, but you know, but when Pinochet came, the, the, the economy grew up. 
Oh yeah, no, yeah. that's uh, uh, well, but you know, but what is this? What is this? this means that the economy can grow up, but this is not the, the case. The case is well, we we have we have no freedom. Well, I can use this for Castro too. Well, well, well. When Castro came, well, the education grew up, yeah. grew up. Well, yeah. uh, the health grew up. Okay, but but this, this, uh, and and the question of freedom. Yes, uh, and to me, it just simply comes down to the ethics of the situation. I believe that a virtuous life will make you happy, but not everyone who is happy is happy as a result of virtue, right? Some guy just wins wins the lottery. He's like dancing in the streets for a day or two, but that doesn't mean that he's lived a virtuous life. I believe that. Virtue leads, no, it's the old Socratic equation, reason equals virtue equals happiness. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything that is rational is, is virtuous. It doesn't mean that everything that is virtuous is going to make you happy. Virtue can be very hard at times. It can make you unpopular. It can make you frightened. It can make, you, it make people aggress against you and so on. So, but in general, I think, I think it's a good equation, reason equals virtue equals happiness. Uh, in the same way, I think that freedom, peaceful cooperation and so on, leads to wealth, uh, leads to good, a good use of resources, leads to environmental responsibility for a variety of reasons. It leads, leads to good things. But you can also get growth in the government or in a state society by borrowing and spending. They count that as growth. You know, in, in America, the GDP goes up if someone gets sick. I mean, that's insane. How can that be economically great because they have to spend money to get better? I mean, this is insane. And in, in Chile, they, they counted government roads to nowhere. And this is why China is building all these cities. You've seen these pictures. You should look at them on the internet. It's creepy. They have these cities built for like a million people. Only 10 more minutes. That's for this comment? Or? Oh, OK, then I'll shut up. And then she finished. Uh, but but, but they, they count all this crazy stuff as producing growth. Uh, this is not that they, you, you hire 500 government workers to dig a hole and fill it up again. But this adds to your GDP. But this is insane. They built more prisons in the United States, and this is counted as getting wealthier. I mean, this. I mean, sure, this was true in, in, under Pinochet as well in Chile. That they, the way that they measure these things, and they don't count debt. I'm getting wealthier because my visa card is running up. Well, no, I'm actually getting poorer because I got to pay the debt plus. I got to pay the principal plus the debt. So it, it, to me, it's how, how you measure these things. There has to be an, in, an, index, an index of economic progress that doesn't count prisons and cancer and you know, roads to nowhere and includes things like debt. And I think with those rational measurements, we'd see things a little more clear. But I completely understand. I mean, I, I think it was Naomi Klein who wrote The Shock Doctrine. I mean, and, and what she was talking about in, in, in Chile under Pinochet, uh, unholy, uh, uh, absolutely horrendous, and, and certainly not a reduction of violence in society. And that's really my goal. I think, yeah, good things come out of not pointing guns at people. I mean, you maybe have no Tarantino films, but, <laughs> but good things come out of it. Um, but, but you don't say that it's the good things that matter. I think it's just the after effect of not using violence to achieve things. Anyway, I'll let you, I've talked a lot, so I'll let you please. Uh, when will it end? <laughs> First thing, uh, I don't believe very much in this this uh, measures of happiness. No? Uh, I think there's the point, methodological point of view is a very complicated one. Second, uh, I uh, I agree with you. I I I I don't like the idea to live in a country like Romania in Ceausescu age or so Polonia in, in Jaroszewski age or something like this. I can uh, I know every every country uh, every ex-communist country, uh, and I can I can agree with you. It's not a very good place to stay, uh, but the question is, um, um, 
can say about it about it i think that um, for example i believe in in a kind of um, development of an idea when republicanism appeared uh, it was a failure a totally failure uh, if you you were in the in 13th century and saying well i'm a republican people will say to you you are totally mad the idea was totally a failure. What, what are you talking about? Today, I think everybody here is a Republican. Uh, I, I understand what the, this first communist experience in the history was a totally, it's totally failure. It was a catastrophe. But I'm not sure that the idea of a more equal society uh, or a, a really strong equal society is a, is a bad one. Where it, it works. works. Oh, for example, I I I'm I think that um, that that um, societies that, for example, I'm not totally against the welf welfare state. I think that uh, it was a very very strong and very important moment uh, in the history of U European societies. I don't think that these societies were were were. The destiny of the society was the, the failure, the economic failure. I think that we can we can go strong, uh, more strong in this kind of, of perspective. Uh, I think that uh, that uh, when we try to use the state for uh, uh, equality, pol uh, politics of equality, uh, the people are more happy. If you want to, to say like this. And uh, I'm very suspicious about every situation that we use it, the idea of uh, a strong free market. Mm -hmm. Because what I, say, wait, what I say in the past is not good. Mm -hmm. What I see in the past is not good. For example, I don't, I don't like, uh, I don't think that the experience of a neoliberalism in, in Anglo-Saxon countries was a, a very, a, a, uh, a good example. I can understand that it's something like well, but it's not. It, it was not really a, a very strong libertarian uh, uh, essay. Uh, well, they they just cut taxes. They don't cut spendings and and, th and, and so on and things like this. I can understand. Then uh, let's say I'm a li I'm a, I'm a, I'm a calm sep sep I'm skeptical about this. But in the skeptical in, in, in this in the really philosophical way. I, I'm waiting to see. Okay? If you can sh show me, well, look, this is, this is a very good example. We can, you can organize a society without a state uh, in a society that we are not, you, you that, that we will not you destroy it by strong inequality. Okay, I go, I go with you. Um, well, I, you had another question? Yeah, Please, I go ahead. To ask you a question. Uh, I agree with you when you said that the system with um, minimum stage evolves to a system with a few stage. And I agree with you that about the aggressive nature of the state. But states appeared in the world after human beings, after human civilization. So how could you guarantee that a stateless society wouldn't evolve again to a society with the state? I can't, obviously. Um, but I, I do think that when we make progress, it sticks. That's a terrible answer, I know. But, but think of, I mean, you don't see politicians now saying, let's bring back slavery. You know, we, we don't see politicians saying, let's uh, ban women from the workforce and put them back in front of the stove, right? I mean, we don't see that. But because when we make progress, generally, it, it sticks. It's not perfect and, and there's still, you know, but, but you don't see a big Nazi party in the world anymore. I mean, there's still a few nut jobs out there who are, you know, nasty and, and broken and so on. But when, when we make progress, it doesn't tend to go back. And there, of course, will be a huge number of, of organizations in a free society that would be strongly resistant to the idea of a state coming back. Right? So uh, there will be people who may provide some kind of collective defense. They don't want a government coming back. There will be people who uh, adjudicate disputes, who provide insurance for breaking of contract, who, who deal with criminal issues and so on. They don't want a state coming back. 
And so you have a lot of organizations within society that would be strongly resistant to the idea of a state coming back. You would have all of the people who see the benefit of a state. You also would have a population used to freedom, used to not having an oligarchical hierarchy breathing down their neck with guns and lasers pointed at them all the time. And they would not be very easy to rule. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, imagine trying to take uh, Barack Obama and H. Rat Brown and, and these guys and putting them back in the cornfield with a ball and chain on their legs. It wouldn't work very well, you know? And, I mean, there's another... I, I go into this... I've got lots of free books on my website at freedomainradio.com if you want. I think there's one called Practical Anarchy, which is the argument as to why you couldn't invade a country uh, that was had no government. I mean, just look at the, the difference in power between the United States military and... Iraqi insurgents, and who won? Because you have a government agency trying to compete with a, quote, private agency. Um, it's just incredible. I mean, Afghanistan has been trying to be ruled 20 times over the past 10 centuries, and they always lose, because they are fighting for their homes, and other people are fighting for government pay. And so there's lots of arguments as to why, and plus, you know, generally countries are taken over to take over a tax structure, and in in the free society, there's no tax structure to take over. It's a lot harder to domesticate wild animals than it is to transfer an animal from one zoo to another. So uh, there's lots of arguments as to why. Uh, but I, you know, I still think, let's say I have cancer, and the doctor says, well, I can cure you for that cancer. And I say, well, what if it comes back? I don't know. Do you still want me to cure you now? <laughs> of course you do, right? I'll take my chances with it coming back as if I get cured now. I think it will stick. Final conclusions, that sounds like quite a high order. <laughs> we solve everything permanently. Yes. Yeah. You said that Ron Paul is not the way. So politics might not be the way to get rid of the state. So what would be this way? What should we do? I mean, it's a multi-generational process. I think we have to understand that. I think that um, in America and in England, I don't know about Canada, uh, to me, still 80 to 90 percent of, of parents are hitting, the, hitting their children. Uh, we, we cannot have a free society if we grow up being hit by our caregivers, because then we're used to violence solving problems, solving conflicts. And then when we grow up, we say, well, we need a central authority who's going to throw people in jail to solve problems. I think it comes that early. The, the state makes no sense logically. It makes no sense morally. The only way it can make sense is if we've had some experience with something like it before. And so I think that aggressive and, and controlling and, and, and perhaps even violent parenting is, it teaches us a kind of language of subjugation and, and a bizarre, irrational respect for power as the only solution to problems. That then when we see the state as adults, we learn about the state, it's like, yeah, I speak this language already. I think so, my goal has been, we can't end the state. You can't sort of say, no, because no, like the guy in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square, in the, you can't do it. So uh, the non-aggression principle, which is thou shalt not initiate force, we enact that in our own homes. Right? We obviously don't do it with our spouses, we don't do it with our children, we reject the use of violence in our personal lives, uh, to me. And then we raise a generation of children uh, who they don't, you know, they're reasoned with, they're negotiated with, and then when they see the state, they were like, well, this is weird. I mean, what? This is not how I've ever been treated before. Uh, what? No, 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 this is not right. Whereas if we, uh, you know, hit and yell and, and bully and, and punish and so on, then, um, of course, then when we come up to a an agency, that makes sense. But we, we want the state to not make sense to people. For it to be, you know, if you ever look at, you know, you see those Hindu gods with like, they're blue, they got an elephant head, 12 arms, and you think, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, to them, it's just, Jesus on a cross. To them, it's perfectly sensible because that's what they've grown up with. So we, I basically what I'm saying is we want the state to look like a blue thing with elephant heads and 12 arms. <laughs> it just looked far into our experience. Uh, I think the only way to really achieve that, I mean, I think we make the philosophical case, we make the uh, moral case, and then the case for practical consequences. But I think much more fundamentally, we have to simply reject the use of violence in our own lives, the use of aggression, the initiation of force, everywhere we can, in our business relationships, through threats, in our personal relationships, through the rejection of violence. That, to me, is how you grow social change in, in areas you can control. And I think politics is a big distraction from that. 
I mean, I've had lots of arguments. Every time I go to a libertarian convention, this topic comes up. Does spanking violate the non-aggression principle? Why does it come up? Because I bring it up. And a lot of these people who are very pro-Ron Paul are, are, are vociferously and aggressively defending the initiation of force against children. Well, how is Ron Paul going to save you from the consequences of, of that aggression in the home? He can't. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, it's very brief, and I've got more uh, on the website, but that's my very, and that's actually my summary, because I don't think I've got anything more important to say than that. Okay, well, I think that um, I can <clears throat> explain my major point of disagreement. I like the idea of a society without coercion. I like the idea that we are fighting for it. But I think that the model of a free market is not a good model for a society without coercion. Why? Because uh, free market is the idea that we can, we can see each other as individuals that are fighting for his own interest or are expressing his own interest. And I'm very suspicious concerning the idea of individual. Uh, I think that uh, uh, major moments, the major moments of the philosophy of 20th century and the 20th century tough uh, were the, put this question in, 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 in the debate. The, the, this quest, the question is, let's say, we can suffer when, when we are not individual. We are not recognized as individual. But we can suffer too when we are just an individual. When we cannot, uh, we, we lost the possibility to make a relationship uh, with something that is in me, but that don't have the form of individual. Don't have the structure of individuality. Uh, there is, in, in each subject, there is something that is not totally individualized, that's something that is not totally uh, a person, but uh, I think this is a very important thing. No? And I believe that we must to try to fight for, for a, a, social, a kind of social bound that could recognize this, let's say, this non-individual structure in each subject. No? Uh, and I think that the model of the free market is not, is, is not a good one because we are not able to think, to, when we, we saw uh, as a, a, a part of a free market, we saw each other as, as just individuals that find for his own interest. Uh, I, I know that this, it, can, it can sound a little bit metaphorical, things like this. Well, uh, I, I, must, I would must to develop this idea, and uh, unfortunately we don't have time. But uh, I would just I would like just to put this this question at the end. And that's uh, I had the first word, so it's only fair to have the la let you have the last one. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, so much. A real pleasure.